Hey everybody! Have you ever done gun mashups in your head? Like what would happen if you took an M16A1 and made it a bullpup? Yeah, I wonder. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about FAMAS, why France adopted it, and why they're saying goodbye. Hey everybody, welcome back to Classic Firearms. I'm Matt, and I've got a couple of the most recognizable bullpup rifles on the table here with me today because I don't have the rifle we're gonna talk about. Of course, today we are talking about the very iconic FAMAS rifle from France, uh, which is another bullpup design and very recognizable due to its profile. Uh, and specifically what we wanna talk about is why did France move away from the FAMAS design that they've used for 40 years and are adopting the HK416 rifle, uh, specifically the HK416F, because they have a specific French designation for that rifle. Um, so first, I think that where we could start is talking about the FAMAS. What is it? Like, what are the features of it? Uh, so of course, the FAMAS is a bullpup design. What that means is that the action of the firearm is behind the trigger. So it loads and fires from a chamber located here in the rear of the gun, uh, very much like this P90. And that is what's the distinguishing you know, part of a bullpup design. So the FAMAS was kind of originally designed in 1967, but it went through quite a period of kind of testing and design before it was adopted. Uh, it would not finally be adopted until 1978. Uh, and that is the point at which you know, France adopted that as a replacement for their previous Moss 4956 rifle. Uh, this kind of transition from the 4956, which was a semi-automatic only in 7.5 by 54 French, to a select fire 556 rifle, uh, mirrors a lot of the different uh, militaries around the world in moving from larger, more full-powered rifles to small sub-caliber rifles. Uh, think the U.S. Army moving from the M14 to the M16, for instance. Or given the time frame, Think of the Russian military moving from the AK-47 uh, to the AK-74. Even though those rifles are much similar in design, uh, moving from that 30 caliber down to a smaller caliber. So again, it was adopted then, and it's been produced in really large numbers. Uh, we'll get into the differences between the types, but the F1 variation of the FAMAS has produced over 400,000 uh, models, uh, sorry, uh, units, and then the G2, kind of an upgraded version, we're looking around 15,000, so they have certainly just produced a ton of these rifles. Um, so the question is like, why would they move away from it? Well, the F1 rifle had some pretty interesting kind of drawbacks to it. Uh, things that uh, make it not the most ideal service rifle. Uh, first off is the fact that disassembling it, servicing it, cleaning it, uh, it's really a pain. Uh, people talk about how it's kind of an hours long process to disassemble, clean, and reassemble a FAMAS rifle. In fact, uh, there was a saying I saw about uh, French foreign legionnaires uh, who said that there were two things that we were unheard of, which was an iron chamois, which I think is their shirt, but somebody can correct me, uh, and a clean FAMAS. So that's kind of funny. Uh, real quick, the name FAMAS stands for Fusil Automatic de Manufacture de Saint-Étienne, which basically just means the autom uh, assault rifle made at Saint-Étienne, which was the government owned manufacturer, uh, kind of their national armory per se. So, you know, the F1 variation had several problems. Uh, it had a plastic chassis and that was actually known to, to break and chip in places. Uh, the most especially kind of on the rear where there was a raised cheek weld area. Uh, so that would break, which of course makes it very difficult to shoot since that is what is rubbing up against your face. Um, it had a very small trigger guard, which meant it was hard to shoot with gloves. Uh, there were a number of problems. Uh, the system itself, that uh, operating system of the FAMAS is a lever delayed blowback. So there's no locking mechanism. There's no gas system. Effectively, there's a lever that provides mechanical disadvantage from the action opening uh, that has to be overcome. And that is what allows the bullet to exit the barrel before, uh, you know, sorry, after the gas pressure has dropped to a safe level. So, you know, in addition to that system meant that it was kind of hard to use any, any wide variety of loads. They kind of had to use a specific load because that lever was tuned to slow down the motion of the bolt based on that specific load. So France adopted a 55 grain projectile. Uh, the rifle was, uh, twist rate was one in 12, which is pretty close to the original M16, one in 14. Uh, and 
It also had to use a steel cased projectile. So they couldn't use ammunition manufactured in other countries. They had to use kind of a French manufactured specific loading using a steel case. Uh, that kind of caused some problems. You know, the whole point of NATO standard or the NATO Alliance is to be able to interchange things like ammunition and magazines. And so the fact that the F1 used a proprietary 25 round mag needed that specific French load uh, caused logistical problems when it comes to the idea of supporting your other allies within the Alliance. Now, they did create a, a upgraded modified version uh, called the G2. Uh, they moved away from the plastic chassis into a fiberglass chassis, which was stronger and less prone to like chipping. They enlarged the trigger guard so that it had something like a kind of saber trigger guard like this, where it would cover your whole hand, meaning that it would be easier to fire with gloves. Uh, they also modified that lever delayed blowback design so that it would work with both the original 55 grain projectiles as well as NATO standard 62 grain projectiles and with steel or brass cases. So you would think, wow, this is this is fantastic. Uh, they changed the barrel twist to one in nine to better shoot those heavy projectiles. And they added some space to the handguard where you could attach accessories. Another problem with the F1 model, the original FAMAS, is that there's basically no way to modify it. Um, so you had places on the G2 where you could add accessories. So you're thinking, great, so the French army upgraded, they moved on to this new model. No. Uh, <laughs> so the, the new model, the G2, was only adopted by certain uh, kind of select special forces groups, such as the uh, Commandos Marine or the Fusilier Marine, which basically means uh, naval riflemen. Uh, the army, including the French Foreign Legion, stuck with the original F1 model uh, with all of its flaws. So that's why there was such a big disparity in the numbers produced, because even though the G2 was adopted, or sorry, developed around 1997, uh, you know, it was only adopted by smaller units within the military and the mass of the French army uh, stuck with the original F1 model. Which kind of, you know, does beg the question, why would they stick with something for so long? Uh, you know, it had a smaller proprietary mag, it had to use a very specific design projectile. Why did they not upgrade at that time, you know, around, uh, around the year 2000 to the G2 model in mass? Uh, so that's not the exact question we're looking at today, um, but it is an interesting one to, to pose as a, you know, food for thought. Moving forward, uh, not long after that, in 20, uh, 2002, MAS, uh, manufacturer de Saint-Étienne, the National Armory, closed. And so, of course, that is a huge part of why this rifle had to be kind of retired from service and they had to look for another rifle. The manufacturer of the rifle was, was no longer in operation. So that means complete rifles. It also means spare parts. And they also were unable to domestically produce that specific 55 grain steel cased ammunition that the F1s required. So of course the number one reason for why they had to transition to a new service rifle is the closing of Saint-Étienne. Uh, there were a number of other possible contributing factors though when you look at how technology has progressed and you know things that we take for granted on most firearms the idea of being able to put on red dots and magnifiers and lights and lasers and all kind of things like that uh, thermal imaging scopes uh, again those original f1 rifles really were not designed to accept those it'd be like if we adopted the original m16 a1 and then we never updated it so you were just stuck with plastic hand guards and maybe you could put a sight on the carry handle uh, definitely not cutting edge technology for a modern service rifle. So the G2 was a little bit better, but again, you still don't have the spare parts. You can use Stenag standard magazines, you can use NATO standard ammunition, but again, those parts availability are simply not there. So by the time we reach 2016, when we're you know really looking at selecting the replacement rifle, uh, these rifles have been in service uh, for over 10 years, even the most recent manufactured ones. And so it's simply an aging armory where supply is going to wear out and you're not able to make the upgrades or replacements you need to. So at that point, uh, you know, they looked around and said, okay, well, uh, do we have a domestic manufacturer? No, since the closing of San Etienne, we do not have a domestic manufacturer capable of providing us with a weapon platform without starting at like the ground level. So at that point, they went to a European uh, tender to you know, see about there could be some missions for a replacement rifle. And they did select uh, HK's 
416 rifle. So we don't have an actual HK 416F, but I do have the closest thing possible. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, the MR556. Uh, you know, and what's really cool about this rifle and why it, I think it's a great variant of the AR kind of platform for the French Redop is the short short gas piston system. Uh, I am a big fan of gas piston operation, uh, as you may be aware uh, by my preference for AKs and SKSs and things of that nature. But so, you know, the short short gas piston is definitely a big, big, big upgrade over a delayed blowback design. Uh, yeah, plus, of course, the AR-15 platform is super easy to disassemble and clean. Uh, it does maintain the commonality of magazines and ammunition with all of the NATO partners. Uh, so the 416F, uh, which was adopted, is basically a select fire version of this rifle. And yeah, you know, the uh, I definitely think that they've done a pretty good job. There was some question about whether they would select something like another bullpup. Uh, obviously, the Steyr AUG was an option. Uh, no, you know, they elected to go with something that uh, would be more of a traditional kind of uh, service rifle as opposed to continuing with uh, with just bullpup designs. Uh, it is interesting, uh, you know, when you think about the fact that they had to go outside of their country. I think that as an American, it's really hard to imagine the idea that you have, you know, a, a arms or an industry that couldn't meet your needs domestically and kind of what that means for your national defense, right? Uh, N27 IAR. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, so this is the, the winner of their their tender program looking for the uh, the replacement. Uh, they had to have certain features. Uh, they needed to shoot, you know, NATO standard 5.56. They had to be able to produce at least uh, an initial batch of 90,000 rifles. And the plan is to have it fully, the, the military fully converted over to this new service rifle by the year 2028. So as of right now, the FAMAS is still actually seeing limited use. I believe that they're prioritizing the army and then they're gonna go back and do things like National Guard, uh, police units, things like that to replace those rifles that are still in service. Um, but you know, even now, after uh, after several years, there's, there's still basically uh, you know five more years of transition time before the FAMAS will be completely out of service. So, I mean, that's a pretty good lifespan for, uh, for service history. You know, that'll give them, what, approximately 50 years of service. Uh, you know, the FAMAS isn't something we're super familiar with here in the U.S. as far as a rifle that you can actually own. Uh, they were imported kind of in some limited numbers in semi-automatic format by Century Arms, but uh, they weren't super successful and that has just meant that they are really expensive if you can find one now. So guys, uh, that is kind of the history of the, the FAMAS and its replacement by the HK 416F. And uh, if you like this kind of historical look at, at gun trends and developments, uh, feel free to comment down below something else that you might like to be able to go over. Uh, I really enjoy this kind of format where we talk about the history of firearms, uh, being a history nerd. Uh, it's one of the things that I really like about firearms that and kind of looking at older weird designs like lever delayed blowbacks. Uh, that is kind of you know interesting that they went with that as opposed to any kind of a locking action. Don't forget guys, you can come visit us over at cfcontest.com. We have some pretty cool stuff of, uh, to look at over there. But uh, as always, you know, leave your comments and we appreciate your time. God bless.